Since the late 1800s until present day, scholars and critics have disagreed over the interpretation of a picture of Dorian Gray. Nils Clausen points out that at the time of publication, secular reviewers and critics were outraged at the picture of Dorian Gray. They called it a rip-off French decadent text. They called it spiritual putrefaction. They called the book poisonous. Interestingly, Christian pub publishers at that same time praised the book for being of high moral import. So, this raises an interesting question. How do the aspects of morality and the aspects of decadence in the book combine together and interplay to form the message of Picture of Dorian Gray? And what is that message? To investigate the message of the Picture of Dorian Gray, we're going to investigate the aspects of morality and decadence in the book. So first, let's look at the aspects of decadence. Now, Clausen points out that Dorian is influenced by Lord Henry's hedonistic philosophy and Basil's homoerotic painting. Um, he goes on to say, this change in Dorian is based upon the idea of decadence, pleasure, and beauty. Basil and Henry both influenced Dorian to passionately desire eternal beauty so much that Dorian cries out, if, I, if it were I who was always to be young and the picture that was to grow old, for that I would give everything. Yes, there is nothing in the whole world that I would not give. I would give my soul for that. All right, now let's dive into the most hedonistic and decadent character in the picture of Dorian Gray, Lord Henry. Here are a couple of quotes that describe his viewpoint on the world. The only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. Now this shows that Lord Henry has a complete lack of regard for morality. He says if you're tempted by something, just do it, just get it out of the way. Another quote from him says, live. Live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. And that is a very fundamental belief of both decadence and hedonism. Now, Sheldon Liebman sums this up pretty nicely for us in his quote. He says, In a world without purpose, the result of faith is disillusionment. The result of action is disappointment. And the result of love or sympathy or compassion is suffering. All right, now let's explore some aspects of morality in the picture of Dorian Gray. Now, clearly there is a large overarching theme of morality in the picture of Dorian Gray, as we can see by the corruption of Dorian's portrait as he commits more and more sins and is more and more immoral. Now, Jean Nonadonde goes in a little bit of depth here. He says, that strange link between the portrait and him becomes so strong that Dorian cannot allow himself to be separated from it for a long time. The painting on the canvas becomes a recipient of every feeling experienced by Dorian. It becomes the record, the diary of his life. Now this shows that the portrait of Dorian Gray reflects morality. Every sin that Dorian commits, the portrait reflects it. So therefore, there is a huge theme of morality, otherwise the portrait would not change. Now what is this morality based on? It's based on traditional Christian and Victorian values. And we can see that from this quote from Basil as he attempts to change Dorian's ways right before Basil's murder. So Basil says, What is that one was taught to say in one's boyhood? Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our sins. Wash away our iniquities. Let us say that together. The prayer of your pride has been answered. The prayer of your repentance will also be answered. I worship you too much. I am punished for it. You worship yourself too much. We are both punished. Now this shows there's a lot of religion here. Lead us not into temptation it's from the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us of our sins is classic uh, Christianity, faith practices, washing away iniquities. So we can see that a lot of this is based on Christian beliefs and traditional views of morality. Now, clearly, Dorian commits a lot of sins, some very obvious, like murdering his closest friend, Basil. But some are a little not so obvious. Um, Edward Brinkley points out that Dorian's first experiment upon the actress Sybil Vane seems to open onto a condemnation of aestheticizing, of fetishizing, human bodies. So obviously leading to someone's suicide is wrong, but the key thing that Brinkley points out here is that Dorian is not appreciating Sybil Vane for being who she is. He is appreciating her for being a beautiful actress and looks at her for nothing more than the art she produces, which is what eventually leads to her suicide. Another thing that is kind of hidden is this, um, what Antonio Santa defines as silent homosexuality. He says, the completion of the painting by Basil 
is motivated by the love the painter feels for his sitter, a silent homosexual love. So this is basically saying, Santa is saying, that the entire downfall of Dorian, all of his corruption, all of his sins, begins because of Basil's homoerotic feelings towards him. Now that we've examined the aspects of morality and the aspects of decadence in the picture of Dorian Gray, let's see what the overall message is, how these two different aspects combined to create what the picture of Dorian Gray is trying to tell us. Now it might be easy to assume, oh, it's just a classic tale of morality. Um, Dorian Gray commits sins and he is punished and eventually dies because of how evil he is. But many, many critics agree that that's not the case. Ali Tagisada and Mochtaba Jahuni say, even if the novel works for the representation of moral qualities, the presentation of such qualities is to be eclipsed by aesthetic merits. Houston Baker agrees with this point, saying that the influences at work cannot be limited to a single drama of damnation and salvation. Well, we can tell it's not a simple tale of morality because, as Joseph Carroll points out, it is nonetheless the case that in Dorian Gray, the Christian ethos manifests itself only negatively as guilt and anguish. There is no moment of transfiguring redemption at the end. So this shows that in a traditional tale of morality, we would have some struggles and then there would be some redemption at the end and it would have a big grand payoff. But the picture of Dorian Gray does not have a grand payoff. There is no redemption, there's no triumph at the end of the book. All that happens is Dorian dies. So although there is themes of Christian morality throughout the book, this isn't a, tr a traditional Christian tale. There's complexities to this. After setting off Dorian's initial downfall by introducing him to Lord Henry and painting the homoerotic picture, Basil Hallward takes on the role of a moral character, a positive influence in Dorian's life, trying to influence him to do the right and good thing. However, this is interesting because Basil Hallward dies partway through the book. Houston Baker points out, that we find Wilde condemning the overly self-conscious artist in the picture of Dorian Gray, referring, of course, to Basil. Basil is an imperfect character. This would be the Redeemer. If we were to have a traditional tale of morality, Basil Hallward would succeed. He would live, and he would influence Dorian into goodness. And yet, this doesn't happen. Instead, who lives? Lord Henry. Lord Henry survives and begins to influence and corrupt Dorian even more to the point of his death. If morality in the end succeeds by killing Dorian, why does Basil Hallward die? And Baker once again points out a very interesting point. He says, if Hallward had possessed a degree of Lord Henry's instinct and individualism, he might have met the crisis of his life successfully. He might have successfully influenced Dorian into making positive decisions, but Basil was too weak. And even Dorian says himself, he says, of course I'm very fond of Harry, but I know you are better than he is. You are not stronger, you are too much afraid of life, but you are better. That is what Dorian says to Basil. So the message of the picture of Dorian Gray is to find the balance between one's personal desires, decadence, and one's own hedonism, and morality. Fall too much to one side and it's detrimental. You have to be somewhere in the middle. If you're too moral, you might end up like Basil, who is not self-realized, he is weak, doesn't know his own internal desires, that it leads to his downfall and death. On the other hand, if you are not moral enough but very self-realized and very in tune with your own hedonism and decadence, like Dorian is, that will also lead to your corruption and downfall. So, what does the picture of Dorian Gray say about this? Where on the spectrum should we be? That is for you to decide. As John Paul Requelme says, in this narrative garden of forking paths, there appears to be a virus that replicates itself in double antithetical forms within a maze that leads us not to an exit, but an impasse. Now, we know Oscar Wilde was influenced greatly by Hoysman, who wrote Against Nature, in which the protagonist, Desaisant, is corrupted by his hedonistic desires and his decadence, and at, by the end of the novel, realizes the only way to break through this, this pain and suffering he's created for himself because of his decadence, because of his hedonism, is to go back to society. And he struggles to find the balance between his hedonistic and personal artistic desires and his place in society. This is very similar to our message from the picture of Dorian Gray of finding one's own balance between morality and their hedonistic and decadent desires. 
Now that we have fully analyzed the message and the philosophical language of the picture of Dorian Gray, one might feel uneasy, unsatisfied by the incompleteness and unansweredness of this message. But, Carol Oates explains, this is part of the book's impact. She says, one feels about it as one feels about the most profoundly haunting works of art, that it has not yet been fully understood. 